Hello, my name is Ben, and I am your host for this week's episode of the Too Vague Podcast. One word, two hosts, stories, trivia, and video games. It's a special day two of PAX episode. We'll start out with our special Seattle version of the podcast in a bag theme. Ben was on the road making content for you with his podcast in a bag. Seattle. So day two of Penny Arcade Expo started in a pretty boring way. I just grabbed a cup of coffee and a pastry from the coffee shop and headed to the show. My first appointment was with Q Games Limited. They are based in Kyoto, Japan. Maybe you know them from their Pixel Junk series of games, which just turned 15 years old this year. I met with Holly Hughes, who is head of product. She showed me a couple of games. The first one I was introduced to was Eden 2, which is a sequel of Eden, which was released in 2012 on the PlayStation 3. It was created by, uh, I think it's Bion, who is a composer and a DJ at the company, and he wanted to create some sort of a game where music was the leading element in the story. And so he created Eden. Here's the description of the original Eden, according to Steam. Swing, climb, and jump your way through massive gardens of vibrant, otherworldly plant life in this truly organic platformer and grow each garden as you explore and guide your tiny yet agile grimp towards the elusive spectra, which are hidden throughout each stage. Ride giant plants as they grow beneath you, then swing from them, destroying pollen prowlers in an ever-increasing cacophony of pollen. Be fired from cannons, float in zero-g, warp to mirror worlds, or simply be buffeted about by the wind while clinging desperately to a dangling leaf. Each garden has a unique set of challenges, puzzles, and enemies that will expand your mind! Exclamation point. Featuring a minimal original techno soundtrack and unique graphics style, both of which were created in harmony with each other by indie multimedia artist Bion, Eden will give you an experience like no other game on this planet or the next. So I hadn't played the original Eden. I think I've seen it. It had a style that looked almost crafted, like it was pieces of paper and very organic looking. But anyway, this was my first time with anything Eden-esque, as it were. Eden 2 was fairly easy to pick up with a bit of advice from Holly, who was, I guess, backseat driving. Not really backseat driving. Backseat advising. We'll call it that. What you do in this game is very similar to the first game. Uh, There are a couple differences. One difference in the game is that you can choose your Grimp character that you want to use for the level. Each one has a different ability that you can use to your advantage to traverse each gorgeous level, like bonuses, like one will be able to swing further or... So there is some strategy involved in picking the grimp that you are most comfortable with to navigate a particular level. The environment looks amazing and the plant elements change based on the items you collect throughout the biome. And each one has a different look and feel to it and of course the music much like the first one kind of complements the gameplay and level advancement eden 2 has been announced but there's no release date yet here's the steam description of eden 2 return to the spectacular ever-changing gardens of psychedelic sights and sounds in this long-awaited sequel to pixel junk eden Jump, spin, and swing to explore beautifully organic worlds in this hypnotic platforming adventure, brought to life in stunning 4K with both art direction and mesmerizing soundtrack from the celebrated multimedia artist Bion. Cultivate new plants, collect pollen, and help seeds sprout new exotic leaves as you journey to collect spectra, the source of all life in the biomes of Eden. Relax and explore the multitude of gardens in single player or 
team up with a partner to pirouette through the world together. With more than 20 peculiar grimps to find and master, 10 vibrant, evolving stages to explore, and 40 game-altering spices to discover, Pixel Junk Eden 2 is a true exploration of life, color, and sound. So the next Pixel Junk offering that Holly showed me was Pixel Junk Scrappers Deluxe. The premise is robots. Of course, robots. Everyone loves robots. There's a giant trash ball that falls to earth, and garbage becomes a very lucrative business. It's a side-scrolling beat-em-up style game where you pick up junk that you throw to your partners and in the back of your customizable garbage truck you choose your bot and your base weapon and then it's time to take out the trash and in typical beat em up style there are weapons and powers hidden throughout the garbage you just have to destroy the pieces of garbage and then sometimes you'll find something during my playthrough with four people i got a samurai sword I like the samurai sword, but there was also a chainsaw that I was tempted to grab too. It's very unique graphic style. All the pixel junk stuff has a very unique sort of look to it. This is multicolored and blocky, but not in a bad way. Limited on the colors, but it makes it look very interesting. It was a lot of fun. Kind of brought me back to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles beat em up days from the arcade. So that was a lot of fun. Here is the Steam description of that game. In Pixel Junk Scrappers Deluxe, clean up the streets of Junktown and trash anyone who gets in your way. Take the role of the Scrappers, a squad of robot garbage collectors working to clean up a grimy city in the not-so-distant future. Sweep the streets alone or form the ultimate team with up to four players. Time is money in Junktown, so stack that trash high and toss it to your squad to boost efficiency for bigger rewards. Garbage collection is only part of the job. Robotic rivals will attack and interfere, so it's up to you to dispose of them while staying on schedule. Teamwork is key to maximizing efficiency and achieving high scores, unlocking new characters, and customization options. So, that was my time at the pixel junk q games area once again thank you very much to holly for showing me the pixel junk offerings at the show this year i'd like to get her on the show too holly seemed interested in the premise of the show the word and all that so hopefully we can get her on at some point let's move into an interesting word in pixel junk which is the word pixel The word pixel is a shortening of the words picture and element. Picture, element, pixel. Allegedly, the word was first published in 1965 by Frederick C. Billingsley of Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology to describe elements of scanned images from space to the moon and Mars. Billingsley said that he learned the word from Keith E. McFarlane at the Link Division of General Precision in Palo Alto, but Keith said he didn't know where it originated from. He just used it because it was simply in use at the time in 1963. So that's kind of an interesting thing when a word, you don't have the exact origin point, but I'm sure that happens with a lot of words, especially new ones that are created. Then after the pixel junk, I moved on to A Corgi's Cozy Hike by Scalisco Games. I met with Johnson, Doe, and Daniel Scalise, and they started a, they're very passionate about dogs and shelters, so they've been making games for a while that are essentially free games where they donate a percentage and add revenue and things to that to these shelters. Currently, for this A Corgi's Cozy Hike, they have a crowdfunding effort on Kickstarter going on. Johnson, he told me he was an art school dropout, and then he turned freelance artist. And so he does the character art. And Dan, who left his job at Amazon to make games, does all the programming and game design. 
Of course, both were very passionate about dogs and helping animals find their forever homes. Scalisco donates at least 10% of their profits from games, merch sales, and ad revenue to animal shelters, predominantly doggone Seattle, because that's where they're from, I believe. But they are open to working with other shelters. A Corgi's Cozy Hike, it looks very much and plays very much like your Sega Genesis era platformers, but in a 3D sort of environment. The camera movement was very smooth, but there were a couple of times the perspective was behind or under surfaces, which is easily remedied, but it may be distracting to some. I'm sure they're going to fix that kind of stuff. In my limited time playing, I only saw one of the biomes featured in this cute miniature adventure. By miniature adventure, I mean it's relatively short. From what Dan said, I, I think I recall he said it's about three hours, three, four hours. I saw other people playing another biome, which is a snow-filled area. As I was playing, one thing that made me chuckle was I found a fire hydrant in between all the collecting, bouncing, climbing, and gliding, marking territory. When I came across the fire hydrant, I knew exactly what I needed to do. (laughs) The game seems like a perfect fit for the Switch, so hopefully they'll reach that Kickstarter goal. I have the information in the show notes if you want to contribute to that. Here is the game description from the Steam page and the press materials they provided. Become a super corgi. Don't let stubby legs stop you. Collect corgi butt power and use ancient corgi superpowers to climb, soar, and prove you're not too stubby to make it wherever you wish. Be a corgi unleashed. Choose your own path around the island and explore your way. Relax at cozy spots, grow your collections, or talk to locals. It's all your choice. You can even toggle the pixelized nostalgia mode on or off in the settings of the game. So check them out and visit their webpage. Hopefully I can get each one of them on, Johnson and Dan, to be on the show. So thank you very much for showing me Well, I would call it a passion project. I really appreciate it. So then on my way to the next exhibit, there was, it kind of caught my eye, this chair in the corner that appeared to be something video game related. It looked unique. So I went over to it. It's the the V-arm chair, but it's VARM chair. (laughs) I think I'm just going to call it the VARM chair. Bateman Labs, located in Vancouver, Canada brought this gaming chair to the show, which they designed with modular attachments and pegs that fit snugly into the evenly spaced sort of receptacles around the chair. It's hard to describe, but if you go to the website, you'll see what I mean. It even looks like where you would stick those things. It almost looks like it's part of the decoration, but it's actually functional. I met brothers Sawyer and Andrew, who founded the company, I was introduced to them by Corey, who is a friend slash designer slash carpenter. The brothers Sawyer and Andrew founded the company in 2020. So Corey was talking to me about the attachments. And he said, even those are wood. They, they do appear because of the color difference. They appear that they are made of plastic or some sort of polymer substance, but they're actually made of stained maple, which they paint black. They design it so it fits just snugly in there and it has a flare out so it stays attached. It does look pretty sharp. So Corey said the base chair itself was designed using Autodesk Fusion 360, which is a CAD CAM computer-aided engineering PCB etc., etc., designer software. They originally modeled the chair in plywood until they got the design right, and then they started making the high-quality wood ones. Corey told me that he got into woodworking after COVID, but before that he worked in audio, and they were all three in a progressive rock band together, I think. <laughs> I think they were they were all in bands before they started really getting into this. One of the brothers went to school for engineering and design. Of course, I decided I was going to mention my very favorite chair. 
And this is without going to their website and finding out that originally the company was making attachments that fit on the POM for computer type desks or holding your laptop in a way that you could see it and still sit comfortably in your chair. But we talked a little bit, uh, Corey and I talked a little bit about the Poong and furniture stability and design a little bit. I keep on saying this for everyone. I would like to get them on the show at some point, but it seems like they're very busy with their design and their business. I will save the price for you to go to their website. With quality merchandise, you do pay. It's not the type of thing that you would find at an Ikea. It is very sturdy, very quality made. So check it out. Uh, I've got the the link in the show notes for you. Thank you very much, Sawyer, Andrew, and Corey, for talking with me about this varm chair. You can correct me if you come on the show. Anyway, the Poong, I'm going to, you know, I mentioned it before. I'm going to mention it again. Uh, here's the, here are the Poong facts. In Swedish, Poong means the point or argument or the punchline. It is a wooden cantilever armchair that IKEA has sold since 1979, and it was designed by Japanese designer Noboru Nakamura in 1976 in collaboration with the project manager Lars Engman. The materials were chosen by Nakamura to evoke a relaxing feeling by allowing the frame to sway like a rocking chair. Yeah, that's one of the things that Corey and I talked about, the flex of the poong. Some people would find that to not be sturdy, but it's part of the design. It actually is supposed to rock like that. It's a, it's a matter of perspective, right? So initially, the poong was named the poem. It was renamed to Poong in 1992. So it's only been the Poong for 31 years. But before that, it was the Poem. So there's your Poong trivia for the episode. So the next game, I went to the Grumpy Face Studios booth. They are a game software company based in Arizona. And They're responsible for a few games, including the original of this one that I'm going to mention. The Steven Universe Light Trilogy, Teeny Titans, Super Mole Escape, and Bring Me Sandwiches. Those last two are definitely old school. Along with this game, which I believe was their very first one, I met with Natalie Negron, who is a producer and marketing manager She introduced me to Chris Graham, the president and creative director of Grumpy Face, who let me play a little bit of the demo version of the new and improved Castle Doom Bad, which they brought to PAX this year. It's a long-awaited sort of reboot slash remake of the original iOS Android version, which came out in 2014 and was published in cooperation with Adult Swim Games. They were finally able to get the rights to make Castle Doom bad. The gameplay is just like the original. It's a well-balanced tower defense game, except this time the game controller is used instead of the touch screen, of course. You play the role of an evil genius who's trying to defend his castle and the princess you captured (laughs) from those meddling heroes. And I would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for those meddling heroes. Chris was watching me and advising me along the way because it had been a long time since I played the original. Made it past a couple of levels with his uh, assistance. And I asked him about the unique art style. And he told me that uh, Justin Booth was the art designer on this version. The art style doesn't deviate too much from the original but it's just enough i think it kind of stays with that general aesthetic but without making too many changes and there are of course some fresh takes and parodies on recognizable do-gooders and obviously there are new traps and items so if you enjoy tower defense games you should absolutely check this out when it's released and here is the description from the steam page Castle Doom Bad is a remade, expanded, resurrected relaunch of the 2014 hit dungeon-keeping strategy defense game 
Coming to Steam for the first time this year with brand new content. You are the villain, and life as a baddie sure is good. At least it was, until pesky heroes decided to invade your quaint little lair of despair. It turns out, they're not too keen on the whole captured princess situation. What's a big boss bad guy to do? Decking out your castle with a heinous heap of traps, monsters, and dastardly weapons seems like a good place to start. Choose from over 35 delightful devious traps and minions to devise and deploy your own diabolical designs of do-gooder destruction. Strategically place traps on walls, ceilings, and floors to uncover the multitude of wicked ways they can complement and combo off of one another. Then add a sinister sprinkle of free-roaming minions and manually activated traps that require your precision timing to make a painful punch. Unlock, upgrade, and customize your traps, troops, and castle on your quest to become the baddest of them all. The new 2023 edition of Castle Doom Bad features top-to-bottom remade remastered graphics with a nefarious new art style. And that's not all. Brand new content and features have been added to improve and expand the original game, giving you a whole new Doom. More details on the new features to be revealed later. So thank you very much, Chris and Natalie for showing me this remade game, Castle Doom Bad, from fellow Arizonans, Grumpy Face Studios. Next, I moved on to the Pokemon Play Lab. While I was taking a break between exhibits, I met a couple of people outside the venue who were working at the Pokemon Play Lab booth, and I asked what they were doing, and they said they were teaching people how to play the card game. I asked them if it was like software and it's like, no, 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 the actual physical card game. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So they said I should stop by and check it out and get some cool swag. Swag being the slang term to describe free company branded merchandise given out by vendors at trade shows to encourage attendees to visit their booth as a form of advertising for those who don't know what swag is. I know swag is another thing, which is scientific wild-ass guess. I say that when it's like, I don't know. So I stopped by. I also have friends who are kind of obsessed with collecting these cards. Nerd Bomber and Tectic, I'm looking at you. Well, I don't know how much they enjoy the collecting part, but I'm sure they enjoy the card playing part. I decided to wait in line then, and I wanted to learn. Unfortunately, it was a little disappointing because I waited in line for probably about half an hour or so. And when I got to the front of the line, there were three people, all solo. So it was like a group of four. And we were asked if we wanted to play the tabletop version, which we'd have to wait a little longer for, or the iPad version. And everyone else in my group wanted to do the iPad version. So being the social butterfly that I am, I was hoping to play with live people, but that wasn't in the cards. See what I did there? So I played through the tutorial on the iPad version and then just left, but I did get some cool Pokemon Play Lab stuff. I got a neat pin and a starter deck at the recommendation of the attendant. I chose the one that looked the coolest. Lucre? moved on to a VR game, which was Journey to Foundation. It is based off of an Isaac Asimov book series developed by Archiact, based in Vancouver, Canada. They made Doom 3 VR Edition, Evasion, and Freediver Triton Town, which I believe are all VR games. So the Isaac Asimov book series, Journey to Foundation, it's based off of that. It's not the Apple TV show, which there's a foundation Apple TV show. It is based on the same series, but it's basically a different timeline for each one. The novellas, well, short stories and novellas of this universe were first published in between 1942 and 1950. Then they were put in to three different collections 
between 1951 and 1953, which were Foundation, Foundation and Empire, and Second Foundation, and those were all released. The trilogy won the one-time Hugo Award for the Best All-Time Series in 1966. Isaac Asimov later added new volumes with two sequels and two prequels, the sequels Foundation's Edge and Foundation and Earth, and the prequels Prelude to Foundation and Forward the Foundation. The general premise of the whole series and the game is that there is a galactic empire and society is nearing extinction. There is a mathematician named Hari Selden who develops a theory of psychohistory, which is essentially an accurate and predictive mathematics of sociology. And using that, Selden foreshadows the imminent fall of the empire, which encompasses the entire Milky Way and sends society into a dark age that would last 30,000 years before arising again, or a second empire arising. There's nothing that can be done to stop it from occurring, but Selden devises a plan to limit the darkness to only 1,000 years. So this is sort of the setup of the story. Chris Rosario from Home Run PR, who set up the meeting with me to see this game, he helped me understand the general idea, which I described earlier, and my character's identity the character I was playing was an agent of the Commission of Public Safety, which sounds kind of ominous. So they were placed in their position by the Empire to investigate the deserters, which are the folks who live in the outskirts, the periphery. And you're going to have to, at some point during the game, choose between one side or the other, either the Resistance or the Empire. So anyway, Chris helped me get into my VR equipment, and it was on the Sony PlayStation VR 2. I was really impressed by the the system itself. I'm still not sure if I would spend the amount I spent on my system to buy the VR 2 yet, but it was really cool. There was the free movement option and then the teleporting option. Some people get motion sick with the free movement but i chose the free movement option and during the 20 or so minutes of gameplay i didn't feel any disorientation or motion sickness or anything didn't lose my balance so it was fine and i think that was probably a testament to the quality of the equipment possibly it's a fairly standard sort of first person perspective game that you find objects, you solve puzzles, you shoot enemies with your psychic powers and your guns. Your guns and your powers are customizable. You will find chips that you can use in your equipment to modify them or give you special abilities. Being able to customize your equipment and stuff and find stuff made it a little more exciting, which I wasn't expecting. I was just expecting sort of like run and gun kind of stuff. While playing the action shooting areas, I kept on accidentally dropping my gun when I thought I was holding it and shooting it. I think that was a me problem, though, because I was gripping the controllers a little strange. I'm not used to it yet, but I think that's something where once I got into it, I would pick it up. Chris showed me one of these things that wasn't really exactly in the demo, but he showed it to me. It was a hacking puzzle sort of dynamic. It was kind of cool. It was like a a Rubik's Cube looking thing. Well, it was a three by three cube. And you had to connect certain areas by, you know, touching the areas of the cube. And then once it's connected, that's the hack. And at first, I was having a little bit of trouble. And there was someone... Okay, this is not a complaint. I get it. But there was someone who was... And it wasn't the presenter's who was kind of backseat driving me, going, no, you got to do this. No, you got to do that, which was kind of annoying. I just continued playing. I ignored it. Chris actually came up, and he kind of told me where I was going wrong, so it made sense. It's coming out for the MetaQuest 2 
the PSVR 2, and the Pico 4. So if you are a fan of science fiction or Isaac Asimov or just VR games in general, this seems like it could be a lot of fun. And there are also consequences in the story. Like I said, there's branching whether or not you align with one faction or the other. A lot of fun. Also impressed by the PSVR 2. If I didn't mention it earlier, Journey to Foundation VR is supposed to be released sometime in the fall this year. So the next game, which I was excited to see, was Animal Well by Shared Memory. Dan Alderman is the head of business and marketing of Shared Memory, and Billy Basso is the sole developer of Shared Memory. I made an appointment through Dan to see the game and possibly get an interview with Billy, which fortunately I was able to do. We sat on the side and talked pretty much the entire time. I don't think I ever actually played the game, but watching people play it was enough. It was that good. As I mentioned, after I received the the press materials and looked at the videos, I was really excited about the whole thing, Uh, meeting Billy. We talked about how he started his career in games. Originally, he was a film school student, but then at some point, he didn't feel like he was invested enough in the craft, like he saw his friends who were really into it, and he wasn't as into it. We talked about the documentary indie game, The Movie, which you should see if you haven't already. It and the game Fez by Phil Fish, who's in the movie. It kind of follows him during the development of his game. Those were sort of inspirations in kind of getting into computer science and game design. So he went into computer science. He graduated uh, with his computer science degree, and he worked for a few notable game companies for about 10 years before he moved on briefly to the medical industry, designing training simulations. In his spare time, he started developing his game engine for what would become Animal Well. Now, since he's established and people are really, a lot of buzz generated about his game, it's really cool. He now develops the game full-time. He told me he's a, I was asking where his inspiration came from, and he's a big fan of survival horror games of the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 era. He wanted to take a similar approach to his game with sort of a different slant. It's all pixel art, so the visual style is very unique. It involves the combination of that pixel art with really, really beautiful lighting and special effects. It's an interesting contrast with the pixel art, and it just makes it very unique looking. There's no linear play in the game. There's no point A to point B. You, you start out with no directions, and you just have to navigate this puzzle-filled world and figure things out along the way. It doesn't tell you anything. It just kind of like lets you explore. It doesn't matter which, which order in which you kind of find these puzzles and solve them. We talked a little bit about his survival horror, his love of survival horror games. And I mentioned this game from Suda51, which is never released in the U.S., called Michigan in Japan. But in Europe, it was called Michigan Report from Hell. And guess where it takes place? Chicago. (laughs) So I heard about it on an old series of Destructoid articles from an author writing under the pseudonym Obscure Video Games. And it's really interesting. They had some, some sort of miscommunication with the way it was released in Europe as opposed to Japan. So anyway, you read up on that. Maybe I'll reserve talking about it in more detail for when I have Billy on the show. Billy, thank you very much. Dan, also thank you very much for setting up the meeting. It was really cool meeting you, Billy. And Dan, too. Please be on the show. And from the Steam page, here's the description. Hatch from your flower and splunk through the beautiful and sometimes haunting world of Animal Well a pixelated wonder rendered in intricate audio and visual detail. Encounter lively creatures, small and large, helpful and ominous, as you discover unconventional upgrades and unravel the well's secret. This is a truly unique experience that can make you laugh with fear, surprise, or delight. Explore a dense interconnected labyrinth 
and unravel its many secrets. Collect items to manipulate your environment in surprising and meaningful ways. Encounter creatures both beautiful and unsettling and try to survive what lurks in the dark. In Animal Well, there is more than what you see. And the final game I saw before the show closed the exhibit halls was a game called Roman Sans Rebuild. It does not have an actual release date as of yet. It is published by Serenity Forge. Chris Souza is a marketing director turned QA tester. He showed me the game and started me out on it. I asked him if he could explain the premise because it looked very unique, very unique in its presentation. And he paused and he said to me that it was very difficult to compare it to anything else he's ever played. So when I started playing, I quickly found out why that is. I spoke with someone from the development team and they sort of described the game as if it was more of an artistic expression or a piece of performance art than it was actually a game, which is not a bad thing. It's just interesting, right? The art style is a very 90s kind of style, which sort of reminded me of the cell shaded Jet Set Radio. You play the game as an employee of a resort, observing the environment from first person perspective. And as you explore... It just gets weirder and weirder. There are broken elevators. There's a boiler room infested with tentacles. There's an outdoor planetarium open to the sun, which is weird. Being from Arizona, I could totally relate to the sun. Unique, surly characters that are asking you to fetch them things and do things because you're an employee of this resort. It was described to me as there are a series of fetch quests that have puzzle elements, and that's what drives the story. I noticed as I was playing, for each interaction I had with an NPC, I'd get this flashy sort of congratulatory graphic, like you see like when you get ranked on games at the end of a level. So I asked if that had any significance, and the person who was showing me, she said that it's sort of making fun of games that do that for each very insignificant action. So I still can't tell you exactly what it is because I didn't get very far. I kept on coming up on the beach. It is an intriguing game looking at the press materials, even though I'm not entirely sure what it is. I think that's, I mean, that sometimes it's a good thing, right? Kind of had that same sort of feeling with World of Horror from day one. And here is the Roman Sands Rebuild, very cryptic description from the Steam page. Entry point. Washed up on the shores of a timeless luxury retreat, you find yourself acquainted with its unhinged inhabitants. They await the day that the sun will swallow the world. You are obligated to serve their whims. There's more to this place than meets the eye. Can you uncover the exit? Stop. Leave it behind. Territorial shift. The world outside is uninhabitable. You cling to life within the confines of a descript zoological research facility. A distant voice on the radio guides you as life support fails. In the face of decay, you must give yourself up to something new. Two broken realities. Stories intertwine in a new trip from the studio behind the IGF award-winning Paratropic. Roman Sands' rebuild is a delirium-charged journey into apocalypse which collides through visual novel, adventure, puzzle-solving, horror, and survival simulation. Your vacation begins summer 2023, which is past. But anyway, it sounds like it's still in development. Or is it? Yeah, it's, the full release is to be determined. So for some reason, that presentation of that game or that game in general sort of reminded me of a book that I read about 20 years ago called Lucky Wander Boy, which is the 2003 debut. And I think the only novel he wrote, D.B. Weiss, Daniel Brett Weiss. He is best known for co-creating Game of Thrones along with David Benihoff. The book's official website describes the work as a novel of video game addiction, Hollywood serfdom, ill-fated romance, and extremely misguided notions about Japan. 
Lucky Wander Boy marks the debut of an original new voice that will captivate wanderers of every description. So that's interesting because his it's completely different. <laughs> I mean, I think it might be the the book might be a sign of the times because I think it was sort of the I'm comparing it to other authors of the day, more notably Nick Hornby, who is an English author who did High Fidelity and those types of books, had kind of had the same sort of feeling to his characters. It's kind of a a no nonsense kind of trying to figure out where they fit, sort of lost but not lost kind of thing. And that's not what I would associate with Game of Thrones at all. It seems like maybe since that time he's developed a very clear understanding of what he wants and where he goes, but the character in the book, the protagonist Adam Pennyman, he's attempting to catalog video games into a book called The Catalog of Obsolete Entertainments, very similar to the obscure video games person on that Destructoid article. He is particularly obsessed with a fictional Japanese arcade game called Lucky Wander Boy, and he spends the majority of the book on a quest to get more information about that game, and it just gets more and more self-serving, and, and it's very strange that he's sort of obsessed. It's, it's a very interesting book about obsession, I think. So check it out. It would be interesting if you are a fan of Game of Thrones, looking at this and seeing this is where he started. It seems like it's a giant change, right? So anyway, I enjoyed the book. I don't think my father liked the book. I think it was more of his 20-somethings whining about trying to find their place and not doing anything about it, which is kind of what he was doing in the book, Adam, Adam Pennyman. So once I was done, I was really exhausted because I had to bounce between the buildings. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but they had two different buildings that were kind of a block and a half away that I had to go between from appointment to appointment. I didn't realize that. So I went back to the hotel, grabbed a nap, and then had a couple of really awesome burgers at the hotel, the cafe in the hotel. I almost had three, but I just stuck to two. And then had a slice of key lime pie to end the day. And then just went to bed after preparing for day three. Thank you very much for listening to me go on about my exciting games and things that I saw at the Penny Arcade Expo. Day two, Saturday. Stay tuned. We'll have more for you. Day three is coming up, the final day that I spent out at PAX. So watch for that. On that note, my name is Ben, and I've been your host of the Two Vague Podcast this week. Have a wonderful night. Bye.